Hey peeps, Pickle16 here on another video of my own to commentate over. We're up to Super Mario 64, The Curse of Invincibility Frames Part 8, which is kind of the midway point of, um, Arc 3. And this was around the time when fan requests began to slow down. And so I had to dump two spots that I had previously planned for the video because nobody had, uh, you know, sent them in. So I, I did what I could and, well, let's start. I was skipping the intro because <laughs> we've seen this like five times and because of the fact that these were coming out not in an uh, these weren't coming out like all the time so every time I thought it would be best to remind everyone what arc we're on plus it's an intro so after the previous parts is ending which was trying to signify to people that, yes, I know these parts are being released outside of me, while I'm outside of YTR, meanwhile the parts are talking about me inside YTR. Um, release date doesn't correlate to when these take place, so... After that was signified, I just continued on with the rest of the story. It was like, I designated a couple of people to each area, including the savers and the rescuers and the people being rescued. So, this was planned, but not the script itself. The script, like, the script was definitely scripted, but it was scripted around the fact these characters would be in the level. So, stories were kind of difficult since... I had to limit myself as to how many times I brought up the the character is compressed thing since in the story it makes sense but as a viewer watching it would get annoying so that was kind of a hindrance. And that's why I turned it down in part 7 and onwards. This guy was the guy making the fight scene at the very end for me and took about a year to do so. I still included him because he asked in when he sent his color code and I obliged. Back then, I didn't have as much of a problem. Although nowadays, I wouldn't even think twice. The, what actually happened there was I tried to um, jump off the um, thing as in to try and get her to move so then it would seem like, oh, she just started. But I, feel, I felt as if that mess up, which was moon jumping from the top, looked better for an introduction. So even if it was a screw up, I went back and looked at it and saw that it was actually fine as it was. <laughs> In the script, it was something like Fawn starts level and collects a few coins. That was meant to be the point. I don't mind showing bits of the progress, but like, I don't want to show like just a four minute uh, scene of gameplay footage with text over it, collecting all the 100 coins because that's not important. That's the mundane part, and I want to skip past all of that. But I won't mind collecting a few coins to show the progress. If anything, this whole arc is mundane. j is another one of the ones like Cool who was out of YTR at the time, but was, uh, like, still a friend, so I needed to include them because they're my friend and I wanted to include them in the story, so they were just one of those YTR warners, be careful of what Starmandry does. 
Ironically enough, after this video released him, like, for a while, he actually went back and forgave Starmathru for a lot of things, so this video makes it seem extremely outdated. Although during the time period, March 2014, of course, he definitely wasn't there, so it makes sense due to the time period, I guess. But, he also, but they also want to warn about the thing, the invincibility frames problem, even though they don't know anything about it. Also, I tended to use the Sonic Lost World song of Windy Hill Act 3 a lot. The reason why I did was because when I played the game, I really liked the song when the rock is chasing you in the level. If you don't know, you're in a uh, cylindrical cave. And at the end, there's some kind of rock or something that, like, some kind of rock hallway which you have to avoid where rocks sometimes come down every so often. The music there was interesting. So I tended to use it a lot since it fit for caves. The OST, though, tended to mix the whole song together, as in the calm part of the song and the part of the song where the rocks are rolling. Although fit, although this is kind of fitting since this is the cave level and there are rolling rocks in this level as well. Guess which one they were trying to rip off. And by they, I mean Sega. There you go, hint as to the fact that he's not in YTR and he's one of those people. There's about like seven of them in this series so far. And then you're going to ask me, why did I force her to collect the life if it's not important? Just cause, I guess? Also, in story, she could have mistaken it for, like, something else. But again, it really doesn't matter. Now, why did I crop this particular scene? It's a really stupid decision. There's a, there's a scuttlebug sh right behind him, and I wanted to um, show that there was, like, nothing there. Stupid decision, honestly, but it's what I did. It's meant to be one of those scared kind of things where one of the younger ones of the cartoon usually just runs around in circles and is worried. Difficult to do in SM64 though when it, it's, um, it doesn't look right. But I did what I could. And yet I show it in the very next scene behind SMG4 fan anyway, so I don't know what my decision making was for. It was actually very difficult to just launch him into the wall like that. Um, it, I wanted him to actually just run into the wall as like a cartoon where um, the character would just run into a wall and go splat. But the thing with Super Mario 64, even if you run into a wall and go like... If you run into that wall from the farthest distance, you're not gonna you're not gonna actually splat at it. You're gonna end up, uh, you know, just wall hugging it. So instead, I dived at it instead to to help it further, to help it accurately explain what I was trying to show that that um, Mario Bloopers guy is scared. This part of the song is what I meant, is why I te tended to use this song often. And then I just end it right there, in the middle of the scene as well. 
something I don't usually do nowadays. I don't you sometimes when I don't have an idea of what to put in a scene because this scene wildly changes the atmosphere like oh yeah we're gonna save save each other so there's no need to panic there wasn't a need to in the first place which is um, a mocking compared to cheeriness so that would be two songs and I don't want to do that and especially like two overused songs when I wouldn't have enough so I'll put silence if there's something that I really don't understand what's fitting for a scene. And then now, since it changes to confusion, it wouldn't make any sense. I was trying to hint at a potential role for him in the future in my series since he was meant probably meant to be in there but after what we've gone through there's no way I would be doing it in the same way now the sad part is I actually wanted to collect 100 coins right there that was like the scene where it was supposed to be oh yeah she's collected 100 coins so I did it in this scene instead have a show like she was collecting the last final coins, I guess. In reality, I always use a code for these sorts of things, and only collect the few coins that I see in the story, so they're like, if you see me collecting a few coins, I haven't activated the code yet, and I've only probably collected like four coins before that point, because of the fact that yeah, I want this to be story um, seen and not gameplay seen. I'm recording this far later than the rest of the commentary and this is because originally when I was uh, recording this particular part of um, the commentary uh, there was a huge desync bug not from my recording or um, from uh, any weird video editing shenanigans YouTube itself buffered on the day I originally commentated over the rest of the video so I'm gonna just let you watch these two, two minutes while I commentate over this specific bit so then the music is actually properly synced because it was cutting off and lagging in the middle of um, my recording. I've never had that happen with YouTube before. It's not my video, it's YouTube literally being a stink. Because the mood of this scene changes so rapidly, what with the fact that we go straight from uh, um, mo like happiness with SMG4 fan, yay, I'm going to be back watching SMG4's videos again, to um, MM's mocking right here, it, changing music wasn't necessarily a thing for me at the time. I should have commentated over all he's in crime. Basically, this whole scene is me trying to activate the code and fiddling around and then, you know, I, I, I didn't end up doing it, so then I recorded another scene instead. One thing I forgot to mention when I was um, commentating over the original um, the original day I recorded this um, was that I for 
I, I pretty much shoehorned Jabro in at the last minute in this particular sp bit because of because of the way I organize the characters. Jabro can really interact with anybody here and know them, aside from them being fans or people he's hardly interacted with as much. Nowadays, I could probably find a decent interaction, but back then it wasn't easy. And so he's almost shoehorned into the scene just so he can have a few more lines than sitting in a room and saying a couple lines like, oh, why is he as bad? Um, also, don't get hit by the enemies. That would be stupid. So I just sort of gave him more lines and he'll get more lines too at a later date. Like, more than here, but like, back here, this particular scene is more of a shoehorn than anything. In this bit, he didn't necessarily, like, not listen to form, but, like, he trusts Enzo more with this whole, um, general scheme of things, since their relationships are far more, um, defined, compared to, uh, his relationship with form. It's not like he doesn't believe her with this whole thing, it's just, um, she's, she's, relationships aren't as close, so it's a little difficult to tell what is exactly going on when you know, the friend that you know could probably know more. Like, what's the point? This particular line is the most e egregious example of me shoehorning this particular scene in. Anyway, I'm going to skip right back to the other recording, so see you. I was about to say, oh yeah, he's decompressed now, but <laughs> that that didn't happen. Uh, I, I, I was like, I'm going to stop the script line before it gets out of hand. So I have several attempts of stopping it in this particular video. of jarring the footage and it's sped up but the song is but I thought it would be better I guess. I'm focusing on him so much because I was going to give him a potential role but that's not gonna happen now. Due to issues. I read about a thing I think it was on TCRF or some other place even the Mario wiki maybe that um lol you can see the door there that um in the original Super Mario 64, you don't actually have to use the metal cap to flip that switch. You can actually ground pound since the, um, like, your ground pound would be so close to the button that it would act, that it would count as you standing on it for a split second before you, um, uh, actually start swimming because of how close, um, the water is to the button. So, I actually wanted to show that trick off so that and since he was the smart character, I thought that would make sense. I actually have an outtake of this where I have to go through it several times. I'm talking about the minions because I was supposed to have them in every level and in story I warned everybody that they were going to be in every level since, y you know, that it kind of happened to me so it kind of is probably going to happen to everybody else. I decided to scrap them after a while, not because they were a bad idea, they could have been a good idea if they had continued, but I felt that they were probably going to get on people's nerves, why the hell are they there, what's their point? The, pro the thing about them is that they're supposed to be stupid, they were based on stupid people, so um, their inclusion in the series is meant as a foil, is meant to 
help him to act stupid on their own accord. So, but because, and also because they weren't really contributing all that much to the story, they were just padding it out. And I wanted other script ideas that didn't have to involve always going to them all the time. So then I scrapped them after the first floor, mainly because of a few of these reasons. So every level from now on is not going to have any problem that's as so minor and not meaningful as a bunch of stupid girls uh, stopping the heroes from actually saving the day. I mean, if I made you hate them, then it kind of worked, didn't it? Since they're supposed to make you hate them. I made Enzo run the other way in the other um, video, but uh, some time would have passed, like maybe a couple minutes, so that would make him running back not seem stupid. Yes, I was literally just standing out there listening. The whole reason is because I need to keep track of if the levels are saved. And the whole point is because if 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 someone is saved, that means that we've stopped Vindimka very slightly. Although that's what I think, since I'm being played for a chump the whole time. <laughs> that's kind of the reason why I show up at all the end of these things, just saying, Yeah, you did it, now go off somewhere. Because that's kind of the point. Since, you know, this is technically my character's mission in the first place. And everyone's helping out along for it. For some reason, jumping onto there was difficult. I'm basically clarifying to the audience that they're not going to be in the videos anymore because there's no because of the reasons I already stated. This video had a particular script in mind which would make no sense if the girls were here because it would make it even worse. And the video would be even longer than what it already is. Also, I tended to have an affinity with Sonic Rush Adventure music quite a lot. Some Sometimes you'd think, why do you even have the affinity to, the, to these songs? Because they work in most situations. In some cases, they're completely underrated. And I mean underrated as in they're not looked at often, not because some people don't like them. Of course some people don't like them, that's the whole point of their very existence. As well as people liking them. Anyway, we were going to skip to Enzo's um, weird trip into Lethal Lava Land. This was supposed to be a joke. The character that normally in most media is seen as, Oh, I like water, is in the fireplace. And his counterpart is supposedly the fan of, the fanboy of fire. So that's, it makes even better sense to put him in a place like this since it allows for the character to be different, I guess. I searched for um, invincibility place sp frame spots in this level. The only places that there legitimately are is um, the eye. The lava doesn't actually give you invincibility frames. It just makes you jump up and then you come down. Uh, there's not really too many spots in this level where you could get invincibility frames, but I decided, oh, both of the characters could have potentially hit um, an eye at some point, so that could... Uh, have uh, helped. And also, if you, the bullies only make you uh, get pushed back a bit, but they don't give you invincibility frames. 
So it was very hard to find spots in this level that actually legitimately gave off invincibility frames so that the characters could legitimately be trapped here under any circumstance. It's a good thing the eyes exist! Because of how sudden the energy vanishes from them when they when they get freed, it's noticeable, which is why the characters comment on it, because in the story they're feeling it. Uh, so the comment is basically the reaction to the, how the characters are being freed. So it's important for that to even exist so that people have a visual interpretation, and by that it's the text of the characters saying, oh, we're free now, apparently. So, or well, something's happening. I had to get really creative with how I worded these sentences so then the characters could still do that whilst not being an annoying d dirtbags every five minutes saying, Oh yeah, we're free, we're not compressed anymore. <laughs> like, for every level. Hunters was random like this. So I made him that way in the series. And even to this day, sometimes he'll still randomly pop up in the chat and uh, say, like, half-faith lines or whatever. So I guess I'm not too out of character. Also, Enzo happened to be quite the humorous type. Well, sort of humorous back then, so pairing Hunters here with him made a little bit of sense, I guess. The two of them are technically still together in the grip today. On, I, on the day I commentate this. Yes, I hate the freeze camera code. It froze in a spot which doesn't really work well and I really wanted it to work properly. I didn't want it to be so close up to the star. But apparently the freeze camera code hated me. No. I could have positioned it better, but I wanted it to be from that angle and, well, yeah, I didn't want it to be so close. I've never, I've never explicitly said, oh yeah, my characters can't moon jump. They can, but it's not like it helps them in every circumstance. Having the ability to levitate yourself whenever the heck you want, it's not, it's, well, levitate in quotes because it's weird, is not going to help you in every situation. So every character in the series can moon jump conveniently when they need to, and there's no particular restriction on on that because why would they need to be? But having the ability to do that, especially with invincibility frames being caused by launching yourself so high up in the air, would exactly be a hindrance. So there's really, why, so nobody really needs to say to me, oh, why'd you make your character's moon jump? Because in this situation, it's a hindrance anyway. In this whole series, anyway. Since full damage can count for invincibility frames as well. And of course, yes, in this level I search for stuff other than full damage. Oh, and uh, the fire things that um, sometimes put fire out, they don't, they don't force you to have invincibility frames, but they can cause the character to just run around madly, so... Trust me, I looked. This is the first level I ever played of a platformer game. I ser yes, I do mean that, because... When I first played Super Mario 64 DS, I had cheats on, and the first level I entered was this level. So, it was the first platforming level I'd ever entered, so I certainly know the ins and outs of it. There, the un there were only so few spots that invincibility frames could actually be triggered in the level that wasn't by full damage. 
And here's our third person, Brandon. Brandon was actually meant to have Zade's role in the story, which you'll find out later. The whole thing was based on a promise, which I'd mentioned. It was based on a promise of a fight scene that he had initially uh, come up with. He asked me for a video that he wanted me to do, which was him in the Starboard. So I made the video, and it's already up on my channel. And then he, his side of the promise was that he was supposedly going to give me a, a fight scene anytime I wanted. And so I held on to that promise and exactly saved it for this. Problem, I didn't realize the, the, prom the promise had an expiry date because he didn't want to do it anymore. And in March of 2014, when the series takes place, he didn't fit what would actually be Brandon's, what would actually be Zade's role now. So Brandon was basically replaced, and he was still he's still in the series, but he's the, one of the YTR Warners, as you'll soon see. <laughs> And Enzo already had a group that I had been and still have been talking in for the mere sake of uh, uh, screwing around and such. Nowadays, though, the group is much different and there's only, like, two people I know, two or three or four people I know who are part of this technical series. Brand is not there anymore. Everyone watching this video is Enzo right there. Enzo tended to be very accepting like that. At the time I was still quite anxious to join a lot of groups since it was popping in and out all the darn time. And I took a very long break from it, the year I'm recording this. I didn't slow it down at the time, it was slowed down, but oh whatever. Since it's sped up again in the next two minutes. Again, you can see I'm moon jumping there, but again, I don't exactly put restrictions on that because in the series it's more of a hindrance than a help. And because it doesn't really help in every situation anyway. The series is not about doing it legit, it's about getting the 100 coin star at all and then escaping no matter what under any circumstance. So it doesn't really matter how they do it, they just have to do it. I initially recorded the scene with the most stupidest graphics because I didn't have the proper textures. Well, some of the proper textures since I, the, the, not the, the, the whole castle is not fully uh, textured properly. So, but the textures that were wrong I needed to fix, so that's kind of a weird goof you'll see in the bloopers. And you technically can because I've release the bloopers and their actual bloopers this was to initiate the actual one that had a plot the rest of them were just straightforward This was what was going on behind the scenes. Ha 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 ha. And then you'll tell me, but didn't she already assign herself to Shifting Sandland? Well, yes, but I wanted to include this in the plot since this was supposedly Zade's go and there was so much going on. This was in obvious reference to the relationship 
that was going on between the two around the time. Of course, I doubt it's exactly the same now, but back then it was quite prominent, the relationship between Zade and Memo. So I needed to include it in some kind of video where the two of them would be in close proximity, and since they're in the basement, and since he's about to go on the thing, yeah. And by thing, like, go on the rescue. I didn't exactly realize you could jump through that, but alright, apparently. I had said in the script to jump up, but after seeing it, I was like, oh, how the heck am I going to do that? So I jumped up and it apparently happened to be, um, transparent, I guess. This was apparently the one with a plot. More of a plot than the others. I wanted the three of them separated to be caused by Vidimka's energy or something like that, that he interfered in some way to cause the three to be separated across the level when they started, so the portal was basically bugged. Yeah, his powers basically interfered. He's essentially still stalking us, but we don't know it entirely. <laughs> What's supposed to happen is that the area is supposed to be vibrating enough to cause anyone on ground to actually have um, invincibility frames. So, as you can see, they're supposed to strike on Memo, this is supposed to be the point, because I couldn't see any reasonable way she could actually uh, end up in invincibility frames where she landed. So, because of the interference, and because, oh yeah, he could probably interfere with them more, and so he, he would naturally be able to cause said invincibility frames wherever he would need to. It's the worst vibrating effect ever, since I can't exactly edit well, but it's meant to indicate the area itself is just, like, vibrating... Not like an earthquake, but just like vibrating as if it's like, as if like the ground's full of electricity or something. The water, the water though, since both of us are in the water, me and uh, Zaid, it wouldn't have caused the vibration to force invincibility frames there since the water doesn't have the same properties. But of course, apparently we would feel waves as said in the text box. That's one of my moon jump codes at work. Uh, it's a moon jump code that forces the swimming animation to look like that. And I thought, oh, that could be a unique thing, I guess. Okay, anyway. But yeah, that's the moon jump code at work. The second one I use mainly, because the second one actually is mapped to the jump button, which is very important in some cases, and is mainly the one I use, unless there's a problem in which I resort to the other one. The only reason I don't resort to the other one as, as often is because it screws up the camera so often that I often don't want to use it, because usually it'll stuff up a shot, and I don't exactly want to do that. Also, this was another example of having this animation happen when I jump off, but... Again, I thought it was much better since it seems like he's jumping from a higher point to get into the water. And I want like the vibration to be happening like right now as this is happening, so that's exactly why he's not like trapped like Memo is. Although Memo didn't really have any time there.
because of um the, the because of the characterization of Memo, it made her eat and and her general personality in relation to these kinds of things, it made it very easy to script a kind of scenario like this. And especially a character like Yoshima who would act like this in such a situation, it was very easy to script the scene. Of course, think some time has passed off screen. Can't exactly freeze it so well when you're in water. I only did it for that other scene because it was so easy. It was supposed that red circle was supposed to be some kind of weird bonding power or whatever that caused Memo to escape because of Zay's weird teleportation power thing. As if he was getting a portion of Samadri's weird star thing, but like I'd enhance on it. Like I'm going to enhance on it anymore now. See, bonding apparently. Again, at the time this was more relevant than it is now. And Yoshimo is another YTR Warner, okay? Although I just made him a generic, oh yeah, watch out for the stuff ahead person. And again, telling the audience, yes, I know about my decisions about YTR. You don't need to keep reminding me that this series is actually taking place in the past. I don't need to keep pu pulling future references like this. I don't say anything about it to Summon 3 because apparently in the story, if Summon 3 were to find out that Yoshua still existed, he would basically kill me. Then you tell me, why didn't you slow down the um, analog for that bit? Because I didn't exactly want it to be that way. I wanted, I wanted it to just be a few small steps forward. Not like actually like walking forward slowly. The others, as in the hunters, fawn, pitchy, everyone else beforehand in the basement is now at the top floor. Again, I had to get creative with angles. I literally thought that, like, Zay was over here, and I, I, this was a scene where I probably could have just put him there, and nothing problematic would have come out of it, but I didn't do that, and now I look like an idiot for not doing so. <laughs> Basically, help explain the whole thing going on to everyone, since it's very confusing and nobody will understand what's going on otherwise. <laughs> there needs to be some explainers in the house. Castle. And Fawn comes down to tell us, oh yeah, let's go to the top floor now. Very hard to film that scene, by the way. See you all, have a good day, peace, and I'll see you in part 9 when we commentate over, basically, the, the, the second to the last part of Arc 3.